This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. Before we get our program started, I want to take a moment to welcome members of our military who are joining us from remote locations around the world over the Internet. Thank you for your emails and many letters and for your service to our country. We have an exciting program today, one that may well cause us to look at our future very differently. In just a moment, one of the most acclaimed theoretical physicists and futurists in the world and the scientist behind string theory, Dr. Michio Kaku, will be joining us. And if you're a regular listener, then you already know that I'm an evolutionary biologist by training. So today, for the first time in radio history, we're going to take a look at just where we started, how fast and far we've come and how much the way we live and work is going to change in the next 100 years. Are we capable of adapting that quickly? We're going to find out today. But before Dr. Kaku joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Michio Kaku was born in San Jose, California. He he was an exceptional student whose interest in science showed itself at a very young age. The story goes that while he was in high school, he built a particle accelerator in his parents' garage. Then at, at the National Science Fair, he caught the eye of physicist Edward Teller, who became a mentor and friend. Kaku went on to earn his undergraduate degree from Stanford University and Ph.D. from the University of California at Berkeley. He conducted research and taught at Princeton and New York University and is presently at the City College of New York. He is one of the most prolific and popular physics, uh, physics writers of our time, and, and he has three New York Times bestsellers to his credit. In addition to hosting his own radio show, he's been a frequent guest on television from The Daily Show to 60 Minutes, Good Morning America, CBS News. Uh, And he has hosted his own series on the Science Channel, the BBC, the Discovery and History Channels, where Kaku explored subjects ranging from time travel, wormholes, death stars to the existence of parallel universes and extraterrestrial life. Today, Kaku hosts the popular radio program Exploration and continues to shake up our perceptions about the world in which we live. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report acclaimed physicist and thought leader, Dr. Michio Kaku. Welcome to the program, Dr. Kaku. Glad to be on it. After such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. (laughs) Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you as a guest today. And congratulations on the success of your book, The Future of the Mind. You know, uh, yeah, number one, the New York Times bestseller list. I, I've never hit number one before, uh, and and it should remain number one for all those listening. Uh, it is such a page turner and such a thrill uh, to take a look at where we've been and where we will likely go. You know, a little while ago, uh, Ray Kurzweil joined us on the program, and he made the comment that um, not, not too long from now. We're going to look back and wonder how in the world we got away without backing up the contents of our brains, Uh, which begs the question, are we discovering that human consciousness is a mechanical process which can be understood and uh, will be replicated like other functions in the human body? Well, you know, we're entering the golden age of neuroscience. Uh, Because of advanced physics, we can appear into our thinking process and see thoughts ricocheting like a ping pong ball inside our skull. We've learned more about the brain in the last 10 years than in all of human history combined. And now the politicians have gotten wind of this. President Barack Obama and the European Union have collectively pledged a billion dollars to create a map of the brain, a connectome containing all our thoughts and emotions and personality. Uh, The short-term goal is to cure mental illness, one of the greatest afflictions of humanity. The Bible mentions mental illness. But beyond that, as you said, Ray has conjectured that maybe we'll have our soul on a disc. It's called the connectome. So in the future, we'll have one disc called the genome with all the genes of our body. We'll have a second disc called the connectome with all the connections of our mind. And then you wonder, well, is the soul nothing but information? Question mark. Well, that is a good question, Mark, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment uh, because, you know, it always seems that when you get into these discussions, people want to know where we stand spiritually. So that that's a good point. Um, 
you know, when asked, many people think the greatest evolutionary asset uh, that we developed is opposable thumbs or standing upright, but that isn't really true. The, the greatest asset any species can have is the ability to look ahead and do thought experiments and foretell negative outcomes and then act in the present to avert or minimize those outcomes. Isn't that the ultimate survival tool? I think so. In fact, in my book, I actually give a definition of consciousness. Uh, thousands of papers have been written about it, but they never define consciousness. I actually define it, and I actually give an evolutionary chart showing that alligators would have a very low level of consciousness because they understand space, where they are in space. Then we have monkeys who understand uh, emotions and social hierarchies. And then we have us, and our level of consciousness is different from that of the animals because we see time. We're the only animals that understand tomorrow. Uh, talk to your dog or cat tonight and train them to understand tomorrow. Uh, you can't do it. Uh, they're basically instinctual. They have a very good understanding of space and emotions and relationships to other animals, but they don't understand how to plan, strategize, scheme. And that's our consciousness. I call that level three. And that separates us from the animal kingdom. But I think there's a continuum, a continuum of consciousness given to us by evolution. And even within human beings, there's different degrees and levels and varieties of consciousness. But the fact That's is, right. is when, when you can look ahead and see negative uh, events about to occur, let's just take weather as an example. We've gotten to a point where we can evacuate whole cities in advance of hurricanes coming on, uh, on, on land. Right. And if you take a look at uh, humans now, uh, we realize that IQ exams are not a very good indicator of success in life. Many high IQ people turn out to be marginal, uh, perhaps even homeless people. However, there is one indicator of success in life that is reproducible in many experiments when you follow people for 30 years, and that is the ability to delay gratification. This is the famous marshmallow test. You give uh, children a chance to one marshmallow now or two marshmallows several e hours later, and then you follow them for 20, 30 years, and they have a higher success rate, higher income, lower divorce rate, uh, better social standing. And the essence of delayed gratification is the ability to see the future, to plan, to strategize, to scheme. While those people who take shortcuts and take the easy way out, unfortunately, they wind up uh, just pumping gas and flipping hamburgers. Now, what about people that worry about determinism? What about people that say, yes, you run the marshmallow test and it becomes a predictor of whether you'll be successful because we know whether you have the self-control to delay gratification or not. And that's such a strong predictor. We now know those that are going to uh, be extremely successful and those that will only survive. Well, the more we learn about the brain, the more we can determine the future outcome to a certain degree. However, I am not a determinist who says that everything is determined from the get-go. However, when somebody does commits a crime and they say, my brain made me do it because there's an anomaly in my brain, so it's not my fault, it's my brain's fault, in some sense they are right, which means that we have to change our understanding of guilt. Guilt for a crime, in some sense, is usually related to perhaps abnormalities in a person's brain. However, I still think that we should lock up serial killers because they are dangerous to society. But the whole concept of who is guilty has to be changed because many times people who are serial killers and people like that, they do have an abnormal brain. And so, but however, I don't think that's a justification for their crimes. They should be locked up anyway, and we should throw away the key. Well, as you point out, the more we learn about how the brain works, the more ramification it begins to have on all social institutions. Now, we have to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to find out just how well we and our leaders are adapting to this new information and change. You're listening to the Costa Report. Know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? 
This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, and I have a question for you, Scott. What goes into making Method Champenois Bubble? You know, it's a process that's really defined by the French government that we've taken and enacted into our wines, which really drive the quality of our sparkling project. So this is a process that the French government defines pretty specifically, and you remain faithful to that. Yeah, 100%, and in some places we push it a little bit. Now, how do the bubbles translate on the palate? You know, it really gives you that vehicle, that mousse for the character of the sparkling wine, carrying the fruit and the complexity. It's the expression of the wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I. Cellars, come taste the difference. Shirt Crafter, your one-stop print shop, has been locally owned and operated in Santa Cruz for a decade, providing custom design services to help you build your brand. Shirt Crafter provides top-of-the-line custom screen printing, digital printing, embroidery, stickers, banners, business cards, and so much more. They carry top-quality brands of gear, from T-shirts and polos to sweatshirts and ball caps. Whether you're outfitting your softball team or team building for your business, Shirt Crafter has it all. So build your brand with Shirt Crafter, located at 111 Ingalls Street in Santa Cruz, or go to www.shirtcrafter.com. Or you could give them a call at 831-423-0537. That's Shirt Crafter, 831-423-0537. Hi, this is Ethan Behrman, a host on the ZBS Radio Network, and I'd like to introduce you to the all-new ZBSRadio.com. ZBS Radio brings you a variety of talk radio programming on subjects like health and nutrition, politics, personal finance, gardening, pet care, technology, and so much more. At ZBSRadio.com, you'll find podcasts as well as live and on-demand streams of exciting and informative talk radio programming that's available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week on your computer or mobile phone. Listen on the web using our streaming player or in your iTunes or other listening software. Also, be sure to check the app section of our website to find mobile apps that make listening to your favorite shows even easier. Check the shows page at zbsradio.com to see our current lineup of shows. New shows will be added all the time. Thank you for listening to the ZBS Radio Network. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is futurist and physicist Dr. Michi Okaku. And before the break, we were talking about how much the new information that we have about how the brain functions uh, is having an effect and and having a widespread effect uh, on everything from how we educate to our legal system. Um, so, Dr. Kaku, with the um, the emergence of artificial intelligence and big data systems and and uh, enhanced predictive abilities, um, is there any danger that we set up a predatory environment where those that know what the future holds prevail and those who don't have the tools to uh, assess quickly and precisely become victims? I mean, take Wall Street, for example. These lightning-fast algorithms give some investment companies, the jump that the rest of us don't have. 
Well, yes and no. Um, I think that capitalism itself is gradually making a historic transition from commodity capitalism to intellectual capitalism. Uh, for example, Tony Blair, uh, former Prime Minister of England, likes to say that England derives more revenue from rock and roll than it does the coal mining industry. <laughs> because coal mining is a commodity, but rock and roll, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, uh, they are huge franchises, and they are basically examples of intellectual capital. And so I I think that, yes, uh, certain people who understand computers, software, big data, they do have an advantage, uh, but realize that people can catch up, and uh, the so-called digital divide, uh, that never happened. In fact, um, the digital poor, well, most of them are on, on the Internet now, kids. Uh, unless you have a Facebook site, uh, you don't exist if you're a child. And so the, the digital divide never materialized because Moore's Law drives down the cost of computers by half every 18 months. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know that there came a point in your career when you became concerned about the way nuclear technology was being used. And even today, we have a tendency to downplay the consequences of nuclear risk until an event like Fukushima occurs. Uh, climate change is another example. Despite all the empirical evidence that the Earth's surface temperature is rising, uh, the latest polls show that 65% of Americans don't believe in global warming. Um, and species are also being eradicated from the planet at a historically unprecedented rate. So my question is this, how prepared are we to handle technologies such as bodiless consciousness and time travel and extraterrestrial life? Well, you know, um, I believe in something called the caveman principle, and that is that our mind, our personalities haven't changed much for about 100,000 years since we emerged from the forest. And that's why many predictions never came to be, like the paperless office. Remember that prediction? I we do. have more papers today <laughs> than before. And why is that? Because 100,000 years ago, we were hunters in the savanna of Africa, uh, meaning that we want proof of the kill. We need hard copy. That's why we love paper and we hate electrons dancing on our computer screen. And people predicted the peopleless city that will all teleconference from home, will never need commuting because the cities will evacuate as people work from home via teleconferencing. That was wrong, too, because during the hunt, we're social animals. We like to bond with other humans, and therefore, um, we want to fraternize with other people. We, we like that close contact, because you can really see people's expressions close up. And after the hunt, what did we do? We made fools of ourselves by getting drunk and dancing and taking off our clothes. Well, that's Facebook. Facebook is nothing but the campfire of 100,000 years ago. Now, the difference is that these cavemen and cave women now have access to nuclear weapons, and they can ruin the atmosphere of the planet. And so the question is, can we cavemen, who haven't changed in personality for 100,000 years, can we handle this new technology? Well, it's not clear. We'll see. Well, Edward O. Wilson was a mentor of mine, has been for 30 years, and he said we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology, and that is a dangerous situation. And I would take it that you'd agree with that assessment. Uh, I would. However, I do think that there's some uh, room for optimism. Uh, we physicists rank civilizations in outer space when we look for them with our instruments. We rank them at type 1, type 2, type 3. We are type 0 at the present time, but in about 100 years we'll hit type 1. Type 1 is a planetary civilization that can control the weather, control the oceans. Type 2 is stellar. They control stars like Star Trek. And type 3 is galactic like in Star Wars. And we are about 100 years. You get a calculator and calculate it. We are about 100 years away from becoming a planetary civilization. And that means that the Internet, for example, what is the Internet anyway? It's the beginning of a type 1 telephone system. And we're seeing the beginning of a type 1 economy with the European Union and a type 1 uh, sports with soccer and the Olympics and type 1 culture with rock and roll. And so it's not clear we're going to make it to type 1 because, of course, we have all the sectarian religious uh, passions of uh, when we emerge from the swamp. But I would hope that we make the transition to type 1, that is a truly planetary civilization, and that will happen around the year 2100.
But there's, uh, you know, one way to look at this is that there's a clock of physiological evolutionary change. And every time that, uh, you know, the hand moves on that clock, 500,000, a million, two million years go by. And then we've got the the accelerating pace at which we're gaining knowledge and inventing new technologies. There, you know, somewhere along the line, the two clocks have to meet. There's a gap there. You know, we've got yeah, these paleolithic the, emotions and we have nuclear weapons. I, I mean, that's a frightening condition, isn't it? Right. However, I think we have a secret weapon. And that is the spreading of the Internet spreads democracy. Uh, during the Cold War, for 50 years, democracies were, uh, dictatorships had lifetime employment for the last 50 years, but not anymore. Demonstrations across the world because of Twitter are overthrowing dictators uh, one by one. And that spreads democracy. But it's and also democ- spread instability. We have greater instability on the global basis than I probably have seen in my lifetime. Uh, yeah, but you see, it's good instability because democracies do not war with other democracies. Uh, think of every war that we had to memorize since we were in grade school, War mm-hmm. of 1812, 1945, 1066, right? Well, they've always been between kings, queens, monarchs, dictators, never between two democracies. And as the Internet spreads democracy, it causes chaos, which I think is a good thing because the chaos is empowerment. We are empowering people who were muzzled for the last 50 years because of the Cold War. And now, because of Twitter, people realize that they don't have to live like this anymore. And they can revolt, and they can, go be, they can create a better society. And there are going to be a lot of twists and turns, because they're going to be compressing, uh, you know, 300 years of European democracy in That's just a few right. decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, but I think that once democracies emerge... They don't war with each other. And I think that's a good thing. So we'll still have wars in the future, uh, but we'll have fewer of them. And I think young kids today feel more global than before. They have a type 1 consciousness. Kids, for example, think nothing of playing video games with somebody in Russia, South Pole, Alaska. Mm -hmm. They play video games with children all over the world. And so their consciousness is less and less sectarian and more and more uh, type 1, that is planetary. And I think that's a good thing. Very well said. Now, uh, we have to take another break, but before we do, I just want to say that I'm a big fan of the show Game. Game of Thrones, and one of the expressions in Game of Thrones, uh, one of the sayings that came across that I loved so much was, chaos is either a pit or it's a ladder, and it depends on your perspective. Uh, Stay right where you are, and we'll come right back after these important messages. You're listening to the Costa Report. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Calling all dogs. Bring your human out to the 13th annual Sea Dog Spring Dog Festival on Sunday, May 18th at Soquel High School from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Help the Coastal Dog Owners Group raise dollars to benefit the lives of local canines and kids. This year's event will feature an adoptable dog showcase, shopping, games, lure coursing, and the popular Fetch a Wave photo booth. Go to CoastalDogs.com for event details and to purchase tickets in advance. <laughs> 
My name is Debbie, and I'm from Aptos. About four years ago, I remodeled my house, and it was professionally decorated. I wanted it to look like a magazine inside, so of course, the end was beautiful plants. But how am I going to take care of them? So I called Jungle Plant, and Dale gave me a fabulous estimate. She comes in faithfully every week, waters, dusts, fertilizes, takes such great care of my indoor plants. And believe me, I have 15 of them, everything from a large ficus to beautiful orchids. She's totally professional, trustworthy. She comes in when I'm not there. I really depend on her to keep things looking great and she's become my really good friend. She's really knowledgeable about plants, knows where to put them so that they thrive and if something goes wrong, she replaces the plants. My plants are a big part of my home decor and I love looking at them and feeling something alive and green. So thanks to Jungle Plant, my home is complete. So give Jungle Plant a call at 462-5806 or visit jungleplant.com. Here's an important message from MZ. As you know, we at KSCO KOMY have the most intelligent audience in all of radio. By design, because we do not allow stupid people to listen to either station. It is our goal to not only have the most intelligent audience in radio, but the healthiest audience as well. That is why we strongly promote 90 for Life Longevity Health products, the Healthy Body Start Pack, and Beyond Tangy Tangerine, In particular, these products are available during business hours at KSCO Studios at 2300 Portola Drive, Santa Cruz, frequently in conjunction with valuable promotions such as Kay's Book, KSCO Hats, Tote Bags, and Bumper Stickers. Now, because we want to make it easier than ever for members of our audience to become and stay healthy, we are looking for 12 retail businesses within our KSCO coverage area to partner with us in our Optimal Health Quest promotion. If you own a business or know someone who owns a business and would like to participate in KSEO's Get Everyone Healthy program and thereby receive advertising incentives and start to build a powerful revenue stream, send an email to me, mz at kseo.com, with the words health promotion in the subject line. Tell me about your business, and I will personally get back to you ASAP. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and today we're speaking with futurist and theoretical physicist Dr. Michio Kaku. And previously, you were pointing out that the Internet has democratized information, and um, uh, this has empowered people around the world to move toward democratic governments. And while this has caused some uh, intermediate instability, we also know from history that democratic nations do not engage in war with other democracies. So now change Changing gears for just a moment, you've been quite courageous when it comes to predicting that we will one day confront the shock of other life forms in space. Can you talk to us uh, about how new technologies and organizations like SETI may be bringing us closer to that day and why it's inevitable? Right. Well, when I was a kid, we could only speculate about other planets in outer space. Now we believe that we can take a census, a census of the Milky Way galaxy. Believe it or not, we now believe there are about 50 billion, that's B with a billion, uh, 50 billion Earth-like planets in our own backyard. So one day when we look at the night sky, we'll wonder whether anyone's looking back at us. And we will have an existential shock realizing that here, there, 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 there are stars with planets going around them that are Earth-like. Now, in the next few years, we'll detect the presence maybe of water on these planets, meaning that they'll have oceans. And water is the universal solvent, the solvent that dissolves organic chemicals and creates life like DNA. That could be a game changer. And so we'll realize that perhaps we are not alone in the universe. Now, most of these planets, however, may have only microbial life, that is, germs and algae, not much more. But a handful of them, perhaps a handful out of 50 billion, may indeed have intelligent life forms like us. And so one day we may have to realize that we're not the only game in town. Now, when we talk about parallel universes, that's a completely different thing. What's the likelihood we find another Earth and another one of us? 
Well, the fact that we're going to find another Earth out there, I think, is inevitable. Sooner or later, we're going to find an Earth-like planet with liquid oceans, mild temperature, and uh, then we'll focus our radio antennas to see whether or not there's intelligent life on that planet. However, don't expect them to land on the White House lawn anytime soon to announce their existence. You see, if they can travel light years uh, distance, from outer space to visit us, they're so advanced that they may not be interested in us. I mean, if you're walking down a country road and you see an anthill, do you go down to the ants and say, I give you trinkets, I give you beads, I give you nuclear energy, take me to your ant queen? Or perhaps you have this politically incorrect urge to step on a few of them. So I think that if they're that advanced, that they can reach us from that great a distance, then we probably don't have much to offer them. Uh, we would be like a deers or raccoons in the forest. Yes, you look at the deers and the raccoons, uh, you wave at them, but you don't really want to engage in a conversation with them. Well, that's very true. In fact, not long ago, my son pointed out that there's only a, f- a less than 5% difference in DNA between us and bonobo monkeys. And he said, and we're not trying to communicate with bonobo monkeys, and we're not trying to ask them what they're thinking or doing. (laughs) So I thought it was a good point. He said, look, if all they'd have to be is 5% uh, more advanced in their genetic evolution, and we will look like bonobos. Right. And we're finding those genes, by the way, that separate us from these chimpanzees. And so we're beginning to understand the origin of intelligence, the origin of where we came from. And by the way, uh, among those genes separating us from the chimpanzees, uh, we live twice as long, meaning that maybe one day we'll find the age genes which control the aging process as we understand the difference between animals and us. With all the terrorism, warfare, bickering that we see on the global stage, uh, is there any part of you that thinks that we've lost sight of the fact that we're all one species presently surviving on one small blue ball in this vast landscape of space? Well, yes. You see, in the last 50 years, we had the Cold War, which froze politics solid. And so those of us who grew up during the Cold War thought that that was the norm. However, that was never the norm. That was the aberration. Now we're going back to politics as usual, where we have racial strife, nations competing with other nations, the usual chaos that existed before the Cold War. The difference, however, is because we have technology, it means people are empowered, which means means that the crises of today are opportunities. The Chinese character for crisis, for example, is a combination of danger and opportunity. So danger and opportunity together means crisis in the Chinese character. And I think that we should accentuate the positive, that is opportunity. Revolutions are never clean. They're always messy. But ultimately, the will of the people will prevail, I think. And I think that's a good thing. I think the greatest endangered species of the future are dictatorships. (laughs) <laughs> That's well said. And uh, it certainly seems to be moving in that direction. Uh, I wouldn't want to be a dictator uh, in these days. But it almost seems as though humanity is in a battle between the lower instruments of our genetic inheritance, uh, those that we share in common with lower animals, and the higher instruments of our inheritance, those that have uh, that make us uniquely human, such as the human mind. Uh, in some ways, religion portrays that as the battle between good and evil. As an evolutionary biologist, I say, well, the terminology is different, but we seem to be battling between those base instincts, the desire, uh, our, our desire to revert to violence, territoriality, to hoard beyond what we need, um, uh, to look at uh, foreign individuals suspiciously. Um, these are really go back to our tribal origins. Uh, That's right. The back of the brain is the so-called reptilian brain, which governs territoriality, uh, aggression, violence, appetite. And so the back of the brain is a very old and ancient part of the brain, but there it is in our brain. But the front part of the brain, because the brain goes from back to front as you mature, the front part of the brain is the human brain, the brain that has compassion, the brain that has empathy, the brain of logic. And I think that we have to accentuate those 
characteristics rather than the animalistic instincts that exist at the back of the brain. Because you know, And we how have are we technology. doing? I mean, how are we doing in terms of emphasizing and rewarding and creating systemic rewards and encouragement to use the front side of the brain? Well, I think we have a long ways to go. Uh, for example, when you have a crisis, uh, in, in democracies, for example, will often twitter their thumbs until it's almost too late, and then democracies will move. Uh, Winston Churchill said that. And when it comes to things like global warming, I think that's probably going to be true. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse until one day a light bulb will go off in front of billions of people, and they'll take global warming very seriously. Because, of course, scientists already take it seriously. We see that with satellites data, with uh, the fact that the Earth is warming up. But unfortunately, people see it through an ideological lens. And that's dangerous when people look at scientific evidence through the prism of ideology. Or our bodies are simply not designed at this point in time and in this point in human evolution to respond to longer term threats. I mean, we see a snake in in, in front of us and our bodies fill with chemicals to to fight or or flee. Uh, But you take a 20 year old, you say, hey, Social Security may run out of money and, you know, their heartbeat doesn't go up one a year, one beat a year. Uh, We just don't have the seem to have the physiological apparatus to respond to longer term threats. Right. Well, realize that uh, there probably is a God gene. That is, we're probably genetically predisposed to be superstitious, to be religious, whatever. However, there's no science gene. Uh, Science is an acquired taste. You have to learn because it is based on things that are testable, reproducible, and falsifiable. And those things are not necessary in the forest. However, religion was actually quite useful in the forest because it held the tribe together, even as we humans gradually became more intelligent over millions of years. Yes. And so we're faced now with a situation that um, we, we still have the savagery of the back part of the brain, but we have all this technology, and hopefully the prefrontal cortex, that is what's behind your forehead, hopefully that part of the brain will see through the logic. And even though there's no science gene, hopefully the, the thinking part of the brain We'll gravitate toward that. Mm -hmm. Now we have to take our last scheduled break. We'll be right back with more from Dr. Kaku. You're listening to the Costa Report. The crisis in the Ukraine is the latest global conflict to pit the United States against Vladimir Putin's Russia. While the Cold War may have ended, U.S.-Russia diplomacy is here to stay. Understanding this volatile new era is not easy. For many years, experts have been trying to explain Russia's new leadership, but cracking the inner circle has remained elusive until now. The American Program Bureau represents some of the most knowledgeable and prominent Russian insiders who are available to speak to your organization. Experts such as Mikhail Gorbachev, former leader of the Soviet Union, and master architect of modern-day Russia. Vladimir Posner, the dean of Russian journalism. Andrei Kosarev, the first foreign minister under Boris Yeltsin. And Pavel Palashenko, chief advisor for 25 years to Gorbachev, are available to speak at your next event. No Speakers Bureau offers greater insights into how Russia impacts our economy, our world, and our lives. To schedule these esteemed leaders for your next event, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or apbspeakers.com. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. 
The sun is high in the sky, which means it's time to get your RV and trailers ready to roll. Hi, I'm Rena Mills, owner of RV Service Center of Santa Cruz, your locally owned RV parts and repair center with over 38 years of service to the Central Coast community. In addition to RV repairs, our qualified staff services and maintains boat, horse, and utility trailers, in addition to toy haulers. We also restore vintage RVs and work hand-in-hand with all insurance companies to ensure that your RV is restored to its original condition. Tune up your RV for summer with RV Service Center's pre-summer special. 20% off all parts and service. Call now. Offer ends Memorial Day. Get your RV and trailers ready to roll with the help of your friends at RV Service Center. You'll find us easy to reach and easy to use at 2525 Mission Street, Cross Streets, Mission and Swift Streets in Santa Cruz. Call us at 831-427-0881 or RV scsc.com the world's biggest garage sale is coming soon hi i'm pastor renee of twin lakes church inviting you to the world's biggest garage sale saturday may 17th every dime goes to second harvest food bank you'll find treasures and you'll feed the hungry at the world's biggest garage sale saturday may 17th starting at 8 at twin lakes church next to cabrillo college for info go to tlc.org that's tlc.org The world's biggest garage sale, Saturday, May 17th. Have you ever watched a group of motorcycles roar on by and wonder, who are those guys? Where are they going? Well, now you can eavesdrop in on their biker world right here on KSCO 1080. A half hour of biker news, clues, and interviews with me, Biker Bob, and some of the motorcycling world's interesting celebrities. Biker Bob Radio on KSCO 1080. Don't miss Biker Bob Radio every Sunday at 3.30 right here on AM 1080 KSCO. Remember, that Sunday at 3.30 on KSCO. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Dr. Michio Kaku. Now, you're one of the most popular theoretical physicists in the world, and and yet you've been fearless in helping all of us come to terms with the biases, fears, and misunderstandings that we harbor about the physical world. And not long ago, you made the statement that science and religion can be in harmony, but only if rational people on both sides engage in honest debate. And the operative word there seems to be rational people. I I happen to agree with you. I I don't see any conflict between religion and science. Um, Going back to the origins of humankind, we've always had beliefs, as you just pointed out, and at the same time been vigorous pursuers of knowledge and facts. So in your view, why does religion feel threatened by science? Well, I think it goes back to what Galileo said, and that is the purpose of science is to determine how the heavens go. The purpose of religion is to determine how to go to heaven. Now, in other words, religion is about ethics, how we behave with regards to each other, and science is about the laws of of nature. And so they're not incompatible. However, the danger occurs when scientists start to dictate how people's ethics, how people should behave, and that when people who are very religious start to determine how the heavens go and determine how the laws of physics operate via ideology. And so I think as long as we have a clear understanding of the separation of the two, uh, they need each other. Science does not dictate ethics. Science does not say what is good, what is bad. Science is neutral on that question. And the same thing for religion. Religion cannot dictate what's happening with Mars or Venus because they exist independent of people's ethics. But however, recently there's been a lot of crossover, and I think that's why we have this furious debate going on right now. Well, we have for folks like Richard Dawkins, right, who fundamentally is an evolutionary biologist, but now he's become the poster child for the atheist movement. And that, to me, is very confusing. Uh, we are part of nature. H- human beings are living, breathing uh, organisms like other organisms on the planet. We're very unique. We're very special. Uh, and we've spent many, many uh, millions of years coming to this point in time. Uh, but we just almost seem to think of ourselves as not part of nature. 
Yes. Um, you know, Einstein was once asked a question about God and religion and things like that. And he said, well, you have to be careful. You have to separate the meaning of God into two parts. One part is the personal God, the God that you pray to, uh, the God that smites the Philistines. That's one God. And then we have the God of Spinoza, that is a God of logic, the God of order, beauty, simplicity, and elegance. He thought that the universe was so gorgeous and so elegant that it could not have been just an accident. The universe could have been random, and yet here we are with this glorious universe. And so if you separate the two, then perhaps you don't get into this quagmire as people confuse the two. And then we get into a whole, the whole de- debate about the Big Bang, about evolution. And I think, again, once people who are religious start to dictate the laws of nature, and when scientists start to dictate ethics, that's when we get into trouble. It's interesting that in science we live with contradictions and ambivalence every minute of every day. You know, I mean, at one time the theory of gravity didn't exactly work with Einstein's theory of relativity. We couldn't, they, they seem to have some co- contradictions amongst them. But we didn't throw one out because of that. We just simply said, well, we don't know how they fit together, but soon we will. One day we will understand that. Um, it, it, I don't understand why there's a need to make one wrong. Uh, yeah, people don't realize that science is not by trashing previous science, it's by building on top of it. So Einstein built on top of Newton, Newton built on top of Galileo. They didn't smash the predecessor theory, they built on it. And each layer makes it more sophisticated. And that's how science works. Science becomes simpler uh, every year as we begin to reduce the laws of biology and evolution and physics and DNA. We begin to see the essence of things. So science actually becomes simpler with time. In fact, you can summarize all the laws of physics on just one sheet of paper. One sheet of paper can summarize everything we know about the universe and the laws of nature. And so I think that simplicity is what guides uh, would guide scientists. But again, when ideologues start to see this, uh, then, of course, things get very blurry because then they start to quote different scriptures, different holy books, and there are lots of different holy books out there, and there's no criterion. However, science has a criterion. It has to be testable, reproducible, and falsifiable. That's what separates science from simply speculation. Mm-hmm. Now, you once said that the fact that Einstein died without discovering a single unifying theory of the universe inspired you in some ways to push our understanding of the physical world to the breaking point. So how close are we to unlocking the theory that explains everything? Uh, yes, when, when Einstein died, uh, they flashed a picture in every newspaper in the world, a picture of his desk. And the caption was, uh, on this desk is the unfinished manuscript of the greatest scientist of our era. Now, I was just a child when Einstein died, but I was mesmerized, absolutely mesmerized by the story. And I said to myself, why couldn't he finish this theory? <laughs> I wanted to be part of this mission, this quest, to finish what was in that book. Well, today we think we have it. It's called string theory. We're testing the periphery of it with the Large Hadron Collider, which is the largest machine of science ever built in the history of the human race. We found the Higgs boson just a few months ago, for which yes. physicists won the Nobel Prize. And next, we hope to find dark matter, which is nothing but a higher vibration of the string. Uh, everything you see around us is nothing but the lowest octave, the lowest octave of tiny little vibrating strings. And the next octave will be dark matter, which we think holds the galaxy together. And so these are all testable predictions, and we hope to test these theories with the Large Hadron Collider and with our satellites uh, that are giving evidence, more and more evidence about the Big Bang and the presence of dark matter, meaning that atoms do not really make up most of the universe, as most high school textbooks say. Yes, we're having to rewrite all those science textbooks now. <laughs> That's right. When I was a kid, things were so simple, right? The universe yes. was made out of atoms, and we had the, the planets of the solar system. Now we, now we have found several thousand planets orbiting other star systems. We know that dark matter, not atoms, make up most of the universe. And we have gorgeous photographs of the explosion which created the universe, uh, the Big Bang. We've actually photographed the microwave radiation bursting out of the creation of the universe. And so these were things that we only imagined when I was a child, and now I 
do these things routinely. It's amazing. Yes, it is amazing, and we are living in such an exciting time from a scientific standpoint. Well, we are out of time for today, but before we say goodbye, I want to thank you for making time to be with us and also for bridging the gap between academia and Main Street by making science relevant and fun again. Thank you, Dr. Kaku. Thank you. And go to my website, mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U.org. And we have over 2 million people that have uh, visited my Facebook site, at Michio Kaku. Yes, and there's a wonderful blog on there, updates on science. I, I'm a big fan, and I, I visit the website uh, very often. So I do encourage listeners to go to your website. Give that website address one more time. Uh, mkaku, M-K-A-K-U dot org. And also Facebook is Michio Kaku, M-I-C-H-I-O-K-A-K-U, one word. Thank you, Dr. Kaku, and come back soon. Okay, my pleasure. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Michio Kaku, you can drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and also our website at RebeccaCosta.com. Uh, there's a contact page there, and you can put your comments down. Uh, love to hear from you. And, and while you're at the website, uh, be sure to pick up your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Just click on the bookstore page where we've curated a, a reading list for listeners who are still curious, inquisitive, and want to understand this topic topsy-turvy world we live in, in a world where there are many more opinions and unproven beliefs than empirical facts on which to base our decisions, the best way to arm ourselves is with knowledge. And that's why we're on the air each and every week, and also why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, and why we curate a reading list which contains books from the most important thinkers in modern times. So go to RebeccaCosta.com and get The Watchman's Rattle, and while you're there, be sure to look over our book list. I I think you'd really enjoy that. Um, I also want to remind you that if you missed any part of today's interview, you can listen to the full program on Apple iTunes, Podbean, Voice America, and also the Costa Report website. My guest next week is award-winning journalist for the Chicago Tribune, Clarence Page. He'll be here to talk about why charges of racism have reared their ugly head again as we approach the midterm elections and what issues are likely to make or break the candidate. So don't miss the always insightful and controversial Clarence Page right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Hi, I'm Pamela fugit hetrick the host of Money Moves. Cash flows and money moves, but do you find money moving out of your wallet faster than it comes in? Do you wish you had a personal money manager? Do your best Dirty Harry imitation. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Go ahead. Make my day. Pretend that your finger is your gun. Quick draw, aim, point, and straight ahead. Notice that one finger is pointing out, but you have at least three pointing back at you. You're the best person to manage your own money. 
To get the tools you need for the job, listen to Money Moves Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. As your host, I promise that each week, Money Moves will leave you with some tips and tools to help you manage your own money. Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. Remember, that's Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. From San Jose to Salinas, Red Hot News Talk, AM 1080, KSCO, Santa Cruz. This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. 